All right. Well, I think, uh, Patrick, we're going to get rolling. All good. We're still, uh, you know, increasing participants, but, um, you know, we'll, uh, they can catch up with us once they hop on. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. We're going to get started now. Um, happy Friday and welcome to the webinar, The Future of Vertical Farming. I'm Colleen and I'm the Regional Business Development Manager for Bios Lighting. Uh, we can't wait for you to hear from our industry experts. Uh, you will see the Q&A option like a lot of you have already taken advantage of. Um, it's either at the bottom right of your screen, um, wherever that Q&A might be. Feel free to type in as many questions as you would like. We will answer all of your questions at the end of this webinar. Um, and we're just gonna hop right into the agenda today. All right, so first what's on the menu, we're gonna meet our speakers. We're gonna break down the panel and give you a glimpse into everyone's backgrounds. Second, we're gonna talk about the future of vertical farming, the current state of the market and where we see growth for the future. We will hear from Agritecture on the definition of vertical farming and how they are helping businesses all over the world. Next, Robert Soler from BIOS is gonna come in and talk about uniformity uh, with BIOS LEDs. Layouts and installations is going to be covered by Patrick Phillips. He will discuss all different types of layouts and installs uh, in our vertical farming facilities. And lastly, we'll cover mobile vertical grow rack systems and how Montel is helping everyone grow uh, more, sorry, grow more in less space. Again, if you have any questions, that seventh uh, what's on the menu is our Q&A. So at the end, again, we'll take all your questions and uh, hopefully get the best answers we can can get you. All right, so here's the panel. I'll be your moderator. Again, I'm Colleen with BioSlighting. Uh, let's introduce Robert Solaire. He's our VP of Biological Research and Technology. He's actually one of our co-founders as well. Uh, he started his career at NASA, um, working at the Space Life Sciences Lab, where he conducted photobiological experiments on light's interaction with bacteria, humans, and plants. He was the subject matter expert for the circadian lighting system installed on the International Space Station that helps astronauts stay on a 24 hour cycle while orbiting the earth every 90 minutes. Pretty cool stuff. He led the team to put the first LED grow lighting system in Antarctica's McMurdo Station and was just named to the LED Magazine's inaugural class, the industry's top 40 under 40 professionals. Next, we have William Fournay. He's the vertical farming research and development expert. He's with Montel. He has a background in plant production, and he was a consultant with a variety of licensed commercial producers. Patrick Phillips, he's our lighting application manager here at BIOS. He has worked in the lighting manufacturing industry for 12 years. Over a third of Patrick's life has been dedicated to the creation and the fabrication of light engines and luminaires from roadway lighting to architectural and from commercial industrial to agriculture. He spent over a third of his life advancing this lighting industry. Last but not least, we have Jeffrey Landau. He's the Director of Business Development for Agritecture. From producing the Atlanta Conference to executing on client projects, Jeffrey works with Agritecture's clients to achieve the objectives of their agriculture business. And prior to Agritecture, he was the Delta Airlines liaison um, he worked in the engineering group and obtained his BSc in mechanical engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology. So those are our moderators. Sorry, those are our panelists. I'm the moderator. We're going to get into the future of vertical farming. I really want to discuss the growth of vertical farming. Uh, the traditional farming has been turned upside down, especially right now because of the global pandemic. We border closures and quarantine and disruptions to our supply chains. Um, really have limited parts of our country um, to, the, to our, our food supply. Uh, in 2019, the vertical farming market reached 4.4 billion in US dollars. In two th sorry, in 2025, that's expected to grow up to 15.7 billion. So we really see uh, just, just how big we're getting with, uh, with the, the installs of vertical farms all over the world. Um, the global population is expected to reach 9.7 billion by 2050. We have to feed everybody. Um, it's estimated that the global food production will increase up to 70% in the next 30 years. So this is why we're seeing all of these articles pop up on what's vertical farming. Uh, I wanna pass it along to Jeffrey now. Jeffrey will take it from here. He's gonna introduce us to vertical farming and how agriculture supports 
uh, CEA businesses all around the world. Patrick, it's all you. And I'm going to jump in. So, hey, everyone, uh, Jeffrey Lana here. Uh, excited to share a bit more about agriculture myself and hear from the rest of our panelists. Um, just to kick us off, I always think it's important just to kind of define what indoor farming is. Um, there are a few you know, terms that get thrown around the industry, but we want to make it very clear about what we're talking about here. So indoor farming, this is a method of growing crops uh, specifically and entirely indoors using a, a growing method called hydroponics. So we are providing the water, the nutrients, and the lighting through artificial lights to plants within a controlled environment. So we're talking about vertical farms and we're talking about hydroponic greenhouses. Um, so no hoop houses, no high tunnels, specifically indoors, 100% controlled environment. Um, and that's really what the focus of the lecture is today. So crop-wise, you can think about your leafy greens, your herbs, your microgreens, um, and then your fruiting and flowering varieties tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, cannabis, uh, whatever you may be considering for a potential operation. Um, so going to the next slide, I can show, tell you a bit more about agriculture. Um, agriculture, we are a global urban agriculture planning uh, company. We primarily provide a variety of services to early stage entrepreneurs looking to start their own commercial urban or CEA operation. Um, we've done about 110 plus projects in about 48 different cities in around 20 plus different countries around the world. Um, and our technical team, we really understand, you know, how these technological applications work in different climates in different regions and under different business models. Um, and that's really critical when you look to build out your business is to understand, you know, who is your customer, um, who is your market, what crops you want to grow, because um, that will help you better understand your technology options as you move forward in your, your design of the business. And for agriculture, what we do with early stage entrepreneurs is really walk them through that process. I um, mean, one of the ways that we do that, um, in the next slide I can show you, is through Agriculture Designer. So this is a great software planning tool that allows any early stage entrepreneur really to model out their own business idea um, from that very starting point of, you know, just the R&D. You know, what kind of operation do I want to build? Greenhouse or vertical farm? Um, where is this going to be? What crops am I going to grow? And what is this going to cost me? And by going through this process, it provides you with the right information and also the right questions to bring to your technology partners. So you might not know what lighting you need. You might not know what growing systems or racks you may need. But by telling them what crops you need, how big your space is and where you're located, they can work with you to help streamline that process um, so that you can get up and running quicker um, and save money in the process. So in the next slide is another image of what this looks like. Um, we provide a feasibility building tool, um, a feasibility overview tool, and a market research tool. Um, and these are the types of questions and the information that you need in order to really get into the, the nitty gritty of what kind of like lighting spectrum will you need to grow. Um, what kind of spacing and plant density you, may you need for your growing systems? What kind of HVAC solutions may you want to consider if you're building, you know, a 5,000 square foot vertical farm versus a 20,000 square foot vertical farm? Um, so for agriculture, our goal is really to help you in those early stages so that you understand your business model, you understand the crops, your customer, um, and just the financial implications of the operation you want to build that way, when you get ready to talk to your technology, technology partners, you are more informed. Um, you can provide them with the questions and answers that they need um, to get you to that, that next stage of getting quotes, getting a site plan, and getting up and running. So I'm going to turn it over to Robert, I think, is next. And he can kind of walk you through just the different uh, applications of vertical layouts and uniformity. All yours, Robert. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm just going to talk about, um, you know, some, some fundamental concepts that you need to know about uniformity. Um, so, hit it. Um, so, when we do think about uniformity, I always want to take a page from nature. So, if a, if a plant sees, you know, it's partially shaded and it's getting more light in one region than the other, um, as you can kind of see here on the bottom uh, left-hand corner, that shrub is getting more light on the left than it is on the right. And so what it's going to do is it's going to respond. Um, in the next image, you'll, you'll kind of see it grow towards where more sunlight's available. 
and then it'll grow um, more vigorously where it is. And so this is uh, a great strategy for plants. Um, and as they grow taller and try to get more, more of that sunlight, um, there's no problem associated with it because um, the sun is infinitely distanced away. So if you're 100 feet tall versus 10 feet tall, you're gonna get the same intensity of light. Next, next point. Um, so all is well in the plant world, but when you go and try to convert this into electric lighting, there are some things that, that aren't quite, uh, don't translate quite as well. Um, so when you do um, HID lighting, um, it, whether it be like a ceramic metal highlight, so traditionally it has always been HID lighting, so hypersodium um, ceramic metal highlights, uh, something like that. What they do is they have an engineered lighting distribution, um, which this is what it looks like. This is a polar plot that what this light's putting out, um, the reflectors and how it's putting light in different angles. And so what you could see is at that max point at that high angle, you get 100 or 832 micromoles per serradian. So there's a lot of light coming in that direction. Um, whereas if you had an LED light source, uh, which is next point, um, what we do is we um, kind of have more of a blob of light, of lower light output. So you can see that instead of 832, you have 62 um, micromoles per um, steradian. And so the reason why that's important is because of inverse square law and how light um, interacts. So this is a little chart to kind of give you a sense of, of how that candela can be converted to PPFD. And so if you get too close at, at 850, you know, so I'll jump back. So inverse square law basically tells us that, you know, if you had a certain distance and you certain PFD, if you cut that in half, you'd get four times as much PPFD. And so what you need to do then is if you have a high intensity, you're going to have to make that plant a lot further away in order for it to grow um, efficiently. Uh, next point. And so the categories that I have here is uh, for, for flowering plants, if it's over 1,500 micromoles per meter squared, um, that's going to start causing damage. Uh, 1,100 or 1,500 is in yellow here. Um, so denoted by red is kind of a burn hazard. Um, if you're in a yellow zone, that's kind of getting close. Green is where you want to be optimal. And you can see as the light intensity is um, lower, 800, 600, 400, you could be closer to the plant without stressing the plant, if you will. And so how this overlays on top of that polar plot, you can see that when you have a, um, a HPS distribution, you gotta be pretty far away from that plant or from that light source before you're out of the red zone. And with a, with a, um, a lower light output, you could be a lot closer in order to um, stay away. Um, and so, what the way that this is done is a light layout is done to create even distributions of light, but that's on day one. And now you have a growing canopy and things could, um, it's a dynamic uh, target that you have. So it becomes a little bit more complicated. So I'll give you an example, just a little side by side. So this is HPS. And so you can kind of see how those red, ar those rainbow arrows overlap. And so on day one, you have a nice even uniformity. Um, and actually it's denoted what's on the canopy right there with this green bar. Um, but as that canopy starts growing and starts growing more into the, the center and the overlap, you'll actually see that, um, that the plants are gonna start using the fact that there's more light available in that, in that overlap area and it's gonna start growing more vigorously. And as we talked about before in nature, that's not a big deal uh, because it, there's never any, any harm in growing more vigorously in a certain region. But because of this whole inverse square law thing and these high pressure or these high intensity lamps, as you start growing into it, you're actually gonna have higher potential of being burnt and actually doing damage to these plants. So the next stage is showing kind of over, over what happens. And now almost your entire crop is kind of in this, um, go back, uh, in this kind of over, over the top and, and potential hazard region. Now, if you take that same example in an LED solution, and really the key is to put lots of low level light, you can see you have these bars spaced uh, six inches apart. Um, and now you can get a lot closer. The other one showed about 40 inches distance to start. Uh, this is 12 inches. And so what happens is, as you do this, because they're lower light level 
bars, everything is even, there's lots of nice overlap and everything grows um, uniformly to the, to the light source. And so what happens is that optimal, that optimal uniformity, that optimal growth place stays throughout the, all three, all, all stages of growth. So some just key tips when you're doing stuff with LEDs are, um, the uniformity generally breaks down um, when the distance from the, the light source to the canopy is about two thirds of the spacing between the light sources. So if you had six inch spacing here, like we're showing here, that means that about four inches distance is when the uniformity starts uh, breaking down. So you wanna be long, further away from four, than four inches from it. Um, but also with uh, the way that our lighting is designed, actually that's the distance where you start kind of entering that burn hazard area. Um, so it's really actually designed to have maximum uniformity up until that point. Um, so you basically have, you wanna design your crop so that you have at harvest is four inches distance away. Um, whatever your starting point is, basically whatever it needs to be in order to that. So ideal for crops is cannabis. It could be down, dimmed down for any other crops. Uh, but the idea is that you never really approach that potential danger zone and you basically, um, um, and there, there's ultimate uniformity the whole way through. So I'm just gonna give you, that was a lot of information, so I'm just gonna um, give you some concluding statements. So. Maximizing uniformity for plant health requires the most amount of low output bars. That, that's the way you want to think about it is small, like only a handful of really bright light sources is going to give you this potential for, for hazard for your plants. Use, breaking that up into smaller incremental bars is going to be way more um, efficient for your uniformity um, and it'll be, make sure that it maximizes your, your plant health. Um, and then so that gives you the ability to be closer to the plants. Um, which means that you can put more shelves um, if we're talking about vertical farming. And then the next point is that uh, that means you get more product. And what we've done at BIOS is we've optimized the product um, to be modular so that you could, you could do it for any crop um, type. But Patrick's going to go into a little bit more details, but this is kind of the gist. As many, the big takeaway here is as many low output bars as you possibly can have is going to be the ideal situation to get as much density and more food and more product out of your vertical farm. Thanks, Robert. Um, Patrick is now going to take that thought from the lighting perspective and, and talk about our layouts and installations um, and how all that works. So Patrick, you wanna take it away? Go ahead. Certainly, certainly. All right, so uh, we'll just jump right into it. Um, we Mobile racking is on the rise, particularly with uh, indoor grows, of course. Um, you can stack multiple tiers on top of each other, and uh, you can move them back and forth to harvest or move, move, uh, move plants as you deem fit for uh, growth phases, et cetera. So to Robert's point, the best thing you can do is have multiple points of light over your, over your uh, crop. So what we have designed here uh, specifically for mobile racking is quick mount brackets. It's two brackets that will run over an eight bar kit I'm not sure how familiar we would be with the LI bars that we, uh, that we supply for our fixture products in general. However, we, uh, we're optimized for this type of grow and no matter what your crop is underneath the light. Uh, so here we're just kind of looking at the overall layout of how these fixtures would look and a mobile rack. I also have some other uh, applications here that also could be going over. But we, we engineer everything for you right off the top if you need it. However, the the entire principle behind our lights is what Robert said is modularity. How adaptable is it, right? Like we used to grow in very specific ways, but now we're, we're breaking that down with advances in lighting. So now we don't have to grow in such a natural rigid format. We can actually start, you know, modernizing that and making it more practical for humans. Um, so on this next slide, uh, you'll, you'll see that we go into static racking here. So this is the same fixture mounted in a different application. And the picture on the uh, on the left is probably the most in intriguing one because we have these bars mounted directly to the ceiling uh, on the on top. And then you, if you look at along the uh, in the racks, they're hung down by jack chain. And then there's uh, an eye bolt that it interfaces with into the fixture. Uh, cords and the spacing allow you to space it. Uh, most of our bars anywhere up to a foot apart. You should never need much further than that, honestly. 
if you're trying to hit general general crops, but that is case specific. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, we have another application that we like to do for um, this is this is shown in a a rack, but however the the bar the the mount that we uh, designed here is actually made so you can hang in a container grow. So the point of these three different pictures to show you is is that BIOS has put a lot of time, money, and effort into designing very unique, scalable solutions. No matter what your grow is, I mean nothing's more uncertain in the future. So we just need to brace it and, and roll with it. And that's what BIOS has done exceptionally well. I've worked for a few different lighting companies and BIOS has really had a stranglehold on being ready for whatever might come. So this, pic, uh, this slide here, this is just uniformity to, uh, um, to again, kind of accommodate Robert's points there. These are in micromoles, uh, the, the color scalings in micromole. And uh, this, this first one here is a four foot by four foot section. The bars are four feet long. And so this would have eight bars centered um, uh, half a foot on center from each other. So you're covering a four foot by four foot area. <coughs> Excuse me. This reading is from four inches away, <coughs> three inches away, I'm sorry. So this would be like an ideal grow for a high demand, like a high light demand, almost, you know, I mean, let's, let's just say uh, this would be ideal for cannabis, honestly. But the next slide will show how you can spread these bars out over four foot by eight foot section and get, you know, great, uh, great performance, lighting performance for leafy greens, fine crop, you know, anything you might, you might think of. Um, and that, and that's now covering double the same one picture covering twice as much square footage, just depending on your light level. And uh, I guess on to the on to the final one. All right, so the future applications, as I said, nothing's more uncertain or amorphous than the future and, and everything. So why don't we just try and control it? What I see happening with LEDs is that we will, the LED, the diode making side is going to have to be able to spread light out further at closer distances. What that will allow us to do is mount the fixture closer to the canopy, which will allow you to tear up more, you know, shelves per space. So now you're now, you know, by buying one different fixture, you're no longer stuck to, you know, five or six tiers. Now you can go up to seven, eight. So you're dramatically increasing your canopy size, or you can just take the simple savings and, and run, right? You can just maximize your overhead or minimize your overhead, maximize profits, or you can just immediately reinvest those, what you're gaining off of, you know, the lower energy, the lower BTUs, everything, and then immediately uh, invest into putting more canopy space in your same facility. So you're going to see these facilities a lot around urban grows or in urban areas because you can be quicker to market that way. So this type of uh, interior growing and, and LEDs is going to be a very unique uh, chemistry going forward, uh, particularly now. I mean, as cliche as it is, nothing more exciting than it is right now. But you now we got some good stuff coming later. And that's it for me. Awesome, Patrick. Thanks so much. Great job. Um, last but not least, we have William. He is from Montel. He's going to talk about growing more and less space uh, and, and adding this huge piece to your vertical farm. And he's going to talk features and benefits and, and really get an understanding of, of what Montel's all about. William, it's all you, buddy. Hello. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I'm super glad to be with you all today. Uh, I'm the vertical farming research and development expert for Motel. Uh, I'm also a, a cannabis uh, specialist. Uh, so who is Motel? Um, we manufacture an engineer mobile multi tier vertical grow rack system. You can change to the next uh, slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, the concept, uh, grow more with less space. Uh, basically, our system allows you to multiply your grow space. You can change. Okay, so uh, here, as you can see, uh, on top of having the possibility to multiply your grow space, uh, you can also maximize your canopy by using uh, model benches on rails. Um, another key benefit is to have the flexibility to open multiple working alleys, alleys uh, at the same time, uh, so uh, your workers are way more uh, efficient.
uh, please change the slide. <laughs> okay, so um, a little bit uh, more about my background. So I used to work uh, at uh, Verde Elite. I was the head grower there. Uh, Verde Elite is a licensed producer based in Quebec. Uh, uh, their mission is to provide the high quality of the dry flower of cannabis. Um, and uh, we had a challenge to uh, increase the capacity of production within the existing layout and existing uh, grow room. So I'm going to show you uh, the solution we ended up with. Okay, so basically all the flowering room and grow room were equipped with uh, existing uh, rolling benches. As you can see here, the canopy is uh, not maximized uh, and the volume is not used uh, fully. Uh, so this is a picture that shows a regular flowering room. Uh, it's very tight in there. Uh, so total, uh, we had uh, 12 flowering room like this uh, and four grow room to provide fully grown uh, veg plant uh, ready to flower. So um, what we did is naturally we, we uh, converted the existing grow room uh, to flowering room. Uh, and, and so that way, uh, these rooms were already equipped with uh, more or less the same equipment. So uh, we went from uh, 12 room to uh, 16 uh, room uh, dedicated to flower. So uh, can you just go back please? Okay, thank you very much. So, so uh, oh, you can keep there, yes, in the mountains. So, so what we did to, uh, uh, to be able to provide the plant, mature plant to, uh, to this flowering room is, we use a, a small room in the facility that was dedicated for pre-veg. And um, uh, we had the uh, communication with Montel and we designed from scratch a nice uh, three tier levels uh, growing system on rails. Uh, this uh, type of racking is the green rack. And uh, within this, this, this really small room, uh, we had the, the place to, uh, put, to install at, basically, there's three different stages of grow in this room. So uh, the first row is for the first week. The second and third rows are for the, third, the second week. And uh, the, the four uh, other rows were for the, la the, the, the third week of uh, vegetation. And after that, we were able to move the plant. They were fully uh, ready to go straight into flowering. I'm going to show you a little bit more picture of the system. You can change the, the slide, please. Thank you very much. So here, uh, it's the beginning of week one. Uh, every time we change stage, we decrease plant density by two, but we increase light intensity by two. You can go to the next slide, please. So here, it's the second week, um, second week of uh, stage two. Uh, for the first two weeks, we used the uh, one liter uh, grow bag in mesh here. Uh, it, the grow medium is uh, cocoa fiber. You can go to the next uh, slide, please. Okay, so here uh, you can see it's the beginning of week three. So uh, the plants are in their final, final uh, container. Uh, and then you're gonna send the next slides, just the end. Oh, thank you very much. So here is the end of uh, week three and uh, the plants are now ready to be moved into uh, the flowering room and uh, to go straight up in flowering. So, okay, one very important challenge we had is to uh, keep the efficiency for the, for the workers. So uh, the room was uh, really small already, but with the motel racking, we were able to also maximize efficiency. So as you can see, there's two team of workers on, on each side of the racking. Uh, it's something that is not even possible in the flowering room with the, the regular rolling bench because when you open it, you have like one team at a time in a single row. Uh, so still, we were able to have uh, happy workers in a safe and ergonomic environment. Uh, on this picture, you can see uh, some product that we offer. Uh, we also customize solution from A to Z uh, with the customers. Uh, okay, so finally to conclude, uh, the top four things to consider when planning your grow. First is the physical layout, two, the lighting, 
three, the growing medium, four, the sustainability features. Uh, but overall, I just want to say that we uh, are not only selling equipment, but we have an ecosystem with our partners of, uh, of expert, and we support you through your project uh, from the beginning to the, uh, to the end. Thank you very much, and uh, please feel free to uh, ask us questions in the Q&A section. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, William. So yeah, I think that's that's what we had from the panelist side. I really want to jump into the Q and A. Um, you know, as the panelists have spoken, you know, I think we talked a lot about maximizing your space the best you can and and making sure your uniformity is is on point. Um, I think that's really important when it comes to to your LED lighting, um, and then using your support systems and software out there uh, like Architecture provides. I think. Uh, their software is super easy to use. I've jumped into it a bunch of times. Um, so using something easy where you can get started and, and really start to plan, um, you know, what you're going to be doing in the future with, with growing. So with all of that, I want to get into the Q&A right now. Give me a second to bring this up and uh, let's jump into some questions that, uh, that there is right here. Okay, so let's go with Greg Adams. Uh, Greg asks, what is the typical lighting power density? Is it measured per cubic foot uh, since we're talking in the vertical axis? Um, that is our first question. Robert, do you want to take that? Um, I was going to actually see, I feel like Patrick has been done a lot more with power densities. Um, or sure. I actually don't quite understand what, the, what is that being asked? Can we get clarification on that? Um, yeah. I think he's just saying, you know, now, you know, there's watts per square foot, right? But now this is going multiple tiers. And so uh, he's just, he's asking two questions. One, what what's typical from a watts per square foot? Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know oh. that we're talking about in cubic feet, but, you know, now right. that we're going, you know, three, four, five tiers high, you know, are we, you know, hitting critical mass on on the energy that's coming into the building. Gotcha. Yeah, so, yeah, about not, well, depending on where you're at, nine cents per watt, particularly in America, is what you really want per square foot, what you'd really like. Um, but that's also very dependent on your, on your canopy and right your crop. I mean, um, for instance, nine cents per, per square foot would be supreme and lettuce growing, and you would probably be the for lack of a better term, got to your in uh, cannabis with that type of, you know, uh, overhead cost. But that's about the ratio, I guess. That's the closest thing I could probably come up with a ratio off the cuff. I would be, I would like a little more elaboration to the question from from the uh, from the you said from Greg. Like, yeah, a little better. I would like to have that opportunity. Great. Well, we'll come back to that, and, and Greg can always reach out to us as well, and we can kind of dig into it a little bit more detail with Greg and, and get into that. So I have a question for um, Montel. Um, recently, you um, released a, a great feature called Loop Air. Um, can you talk to us about uh, what Loop Air is all about and, and how that air distribution system works? And that's from Bob Hoffman. Yes. Okay, I'll try my best. Uh, I just joined the uh, motel uh, just recently, so I, I apologize in advance. I don't have all the details uh, with me right now, but uh, basically... Maybe talk about how it would help you, you know, when you were a grower, when, when, you, when you were working in facilities, you know, what's that loop air system doing? Is It's yeah, taking yeah, out yeah, heat, yeah. correct? So, so uh, air, air distribution is... Uh, something very challenging in a in a grow environment uh, especially indoor uh, even on a sing, like single level tier uh, canopy uh, type of system and when you multiply your 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 shell if you want it's it's even harder to to have a a, a well uh, standardized uh, airflow everywhere so so yes this system will will just allow an help to make sure there's no uh, hot spot uh, in the uh, zone of your room and uh, and also uh, when you go higher in your uh, in your in your racking so uh, and uh, it's uh, it's a solution that it is uh, modular 
and um, a little bit easy, easier than what is available on the market to, uh, for sanitation. So in between each batch, uh, there's a system that, that, that uh, gives the flexibility to, 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 to have a, a more efficient uh, sanitation process. Awesome. Great answer. Um, again, if you would like any more information, um, there's some amazing people over at Montel that can help kind of delve more into what the Loop Air system is all about. Um, so let's go to another question. Um, while William, you're here, sorry, don't mean to uh, give you one more question, but how do you handle drainage using a mobile rack system? Your photos show the fill side, but not the drain. That's from Nicholas. That's from Nicholas Walters. Hello, Nicholas. It's a very good question. Um, for this particular setup, the, we used uh, flexible uh, hose drain with uh, a manifold that was uh, redirecting all the draining water into the the physical drain of the room. So there, there's different several ways to to do it. Uh, it, it, it also depends if you have your drain in your room or not. If you don't have an existing drain in your, in your floor, floor uh, it's also possible to use a pump with float and reservoir. I would not recommend to build a new room like that, but if, if you have to, it's, it's possible. Uh, there's also another way you can handle the, the drainage is to install uh, some kind of a gutter uh, at the end of your racking so you can uh, just have an elbow that drop the draining water in one big gutter that collect everything and then redirect the water in your uh, drain in your floor. That would be the ideal so you don't have uh, like the risk to have a draining hose uh, that breaks when uh, your staff work at the end of your room or something like that. So, but for that particular setup, we use a flexible uh, hose uh, drain. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to actually answer a question. Are the BiosLights fixtures uh, DLC Design Lab Consortium certified? I'm just curious for the reason of qualifying for incentive programs with utility rebates. Great question, Zachary. Um, yes, we are DLC approved. Um, we have DLC uh, UL uh, approvals. So hopefully I can answer any questions you need about that, but um, just wanted to make sure that that was covered. Um, temperature is a major challenge in high density and multi-tier systems. What is the most efficient LED cooling method for such systems? Uh, that comes from Graham Payton. So uh, we have a, a BIOS team, Robert, um, Patrick, whoever wants to take that, that would be uh, fantastic. Uh, repeat the question again. Sure. So temperature is a major challenge in high density and multi-tier systems. What's the most efficient LED cooling method um, for such systems? Whether we use the loop air system in racking to, to push yeah, air, them out. Airflow is the best way. Um, you you want to be able to just get air that's going to be good for the plants, uh, but it's going to be great for, um, you know, these are passively cooled systems, um, which means that they rely on just natural convection. But if you get forced air across them, they're going to be rock stars. They're going to perform really, really efficiently. Great, so fans, cooling systems, like that type of thing to, yep. to help with that, that temperature. Yeah, you um, want to get airflow in there. That's going to, you know, it's good for transpiration of the plants, but it's, it's going to be great for the, for the performance of the, of the fixtures as well. Great. Um, okay. Sorry, there's like so many questions. I'm trying to get through all these. Um, I think this is a great question from Victor uh, Eberhard. I didn't hear much talk about spectrum of light. Um, is there a general specification for what typical plants want to have or are there custom solutions spectrally for different plants? Um, yeah, so I mean our, our spectrums is really uh, have been tried and uh, tested and kind of designed for for most crops um, specifically cannabis um, but there is um, you know there are things you could do to tweak the spectrum here and there um, change the morphology um, change some of the uh, the you know things like anthocyanin and um, and other um, chemical 
um, compositions of the plants, but, but by and large for photosynthesis, it really is, um, our spectrum has been kind of tweaked towards, um, towards max efficiency. So max micromoles per joule. Um, and those uh, LI bars that we were talking about, the eight bar kit was uh, 2.51 micromoles per, per joule bar is, um, is pretty efficient. So it's really kind of tweaked for, for that, trying to get the most um, photosynthetic yield out of, a, out of a diode. And I think on that same question, um, we talk about spectrum and, you know, replicating the sun, I think, which is really important. Um, you know, that's how our plants are growing now, I think. Um, bringing it indoors, what sort of anthocyanin response do you see with your APAR units? Um, you know, are we seeing anything um, different response-wise um, from that? And that comes from Eric Stiro. Yeah, that's a tough yeah. question. Um, it really all depends on a lot of a lot of different elements. Um, but you know, do I, you have anything that that you can think of? Um, yeah, that 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 could answer that for, uh, for Eric. Yeah, some of the state of the art is, you know, is to have a single blue peak, which, you know, pretty much drives that anthocyanin uh, production. There are things you could do with um, what I like to refer to as broad spectrum blue um, that kind of uh, dithers it out. Um, and, and that's actually really uh, an interesting um, thing that we're, we're looking at. I don't have too much of a, a great answer as to specifics, but I think that uh, to enhance the anthocyanin production, um, you'd probably want to go with a broad spectrum blue, um, but you need a baseline first in order to get there. Awesome. Uh, question for William. Does loop air have a horizontal air distribution or vertical? We'll give Robert a break for a minute. Let him drink uh, some water. I'm <laughs> not the... Uh... I'm not sure exactly I understand, but I'll try my best. Uh, okay, so what is very uh, incredible with this system is it not only moves the airs, but it, it's going to suck the hot air from the middle of your shelf, at the, the, in between your, your uh, growing uh, table and uh, your light fixture. So it will remove the heat and uh, redistribute fresh water on the side. So it's not only moving from top to bottom. So, uh, so it, yeah, basically this is it. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that uh, it answers your question. Um, but that, that I, uh, yeah, I have more details. Uh, I, the direction of the airflow is more like, I think around 45 degrees. So it's that way on the side. So we have that kind of nice, nice loop and distribution. Awesome. Let's get Jeffrey involved. He looks like he's getting a little sleepy. I'm um, here. I saw <laughs> Brand, um, two questions, one the, from Brandon and, and Vijay. Yeah. So you want to um, you you read out, you want me to read out Brandon's question? Yeah, go for it. Just so people can understand what he's asking. So Brandon writes, where do you see indoor vertical gardening evolving as a percentage of overall crops grown worldwide? Uh, over the next 10 to 20 years? Do you see it mostly in largely populated areas or individual small towns all over the place? So why don't you start with that one? Yeah, so um, indoor vertical farms, you know, for now we see it growing in mostly uh, high density populated environments, um, specifically more so in environments that I think are importing a lot of their, their product from other countries or other locations here in the U.S., you know, majority of our fresh produce comes from the West Coast. So all these cities on the East Coast, Philadelphia, New York City, Boston, um, there's opportunity for those types of locations to, to build more uh, vertical farms or more CA operations to help supply and offset um, the food miles that products travel from the West Coast. Um, I think that there was another question in there about, you know, what um, crops do we currently see in vertical farming that are, are viable at scale? Um, yes. and it's cannabis, microgreens, leafy greens, herbs as well. Um, we are seeing some companies experiment with strawberries and indoor vertical farm, but in a greenhouse, all those crops have been proven to be profitable at scale. So your leafy greens, your herb, your microgreens, 
and then your fruiting and flowering. So cannabis, peppers, cucumbers, tomatoes, um, all can be done in hydroponic systems. The fruiting and flowering um, are a bit more efficient and cost effective in a greenhouse environment because you can also maximize your sunlight uh, coming from the sun and then supplement based on the DLL, DLI of your region, so the daily light integral um, of your location. And then I think there was another question that ties into this is, you know, is vertical farming um, inevitable? Um, and does it have any impact on the quality of the produce when compared to traditional soil farming? Um, so what vertical farming and controlled environment agriculture really provide is a controlled space to replicate and create predictable uh, yields compared to traditional farming. So you don't have to worry about extreme weather events, um, droughts, fires, anything that is a bit beyond control of what typical operators can, can uh, change in a controlled environment because you can control your HVAC, your airflow, your temperature, your humidity, your nutrients, you can grow higher yielding crop uh, more times per year compared to a traditional farm. And because you're also in a controlled environment, you can also maximize um, what's coming in and out in terms of food safety. So you have certain uh, integrated pest management strategies, you have certain food safety protocols um, and SOPs that you follow. And because of that, you can use limited to almost no pesticides or herbicides as part of your, your growing production strategy. And in that terms, you know, you may not have an organic certified crop, but you have a pesticide free crop. And that could be, you know, a more, a better value proposition to your customer, depending on where you're located. Awesome. I want to jump in real quick, Robert. I saw that you answered Gene's question, but maybe um, in case he didn't see that you answered it, we could answer it live as well. Okay, so where Gene said where there are no sidewalls? Yeah. Okay, so Gene asked uh, why there are no sidewalls of white material in any of the images presented, and as wouldn't that increase uniformity as well as intensity? Uh, Robert wrote, great question. I think you're 100% right, assuming there's an aisle between the racks. Uh, however, Montel's approach is to move the racks so they butt up right next to each other. Uh, so I think the walls may not uh, may not add as much benefit. Yeah, so it's, a lot of times you'll put a wall, uh, reflective material, so that the, the light that kind of spills off gets bounced back in. It'll help with uniformity. It does a lot of really good things. Um, but that assumes that there, um, you know, there's an aisle, there's an end. But I, I, the way that the Montel system is, these, these racks kind of butt right up against each other. So, so all that stuff that would kind of be spilling off um, is actually going into the next rack. Um, so it's actually, a, a, I don't think that the white walls would provide as much benefit as it, it would, would in a traditional one where the, wall, where the racks aren't moving. Got it. If that makes sense. Um, Makes sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to our participants. And again, if you, uh, anybody wants to delve in any deeper with these, these questions, um, we'd be more than happy to take it offline with you. Um, is the lighting system expected to run 24 seven? Uh, really depends on, or is it best periodically for NFT systems? Uh, Ernesto Ku um, asked that. I, I think it has a, a, you know, it really depends. Um, Patrick, do you, do you want to take this since, since you're uh, you know, we talk a lot about application and, and, and how that works with our LEDs. Sure. Um, can I read that question so I can answer it? Yeah, absolutely. Where, where is it? I'm trying to, is it open? Um, yeah, it's in the Q&A. It just says, is a lighting system expected to run 24 seven um, or is it best periodically for uh, an NFT system? Um, why don't oh. you just talk about more of uh, timing yeah, and, and dimming and, and all that fun stuff? Yeah, so that, what we what we typically do is design around photo periods based on crop types. So, you know, for instance, I, let's just throw strawberries out there. So if you're doing supplemental lighting for strawberry or, or something, um, you know, you want 12 hours of salt. So um, you would do off period as well as on. Uh, I do know that there are, are systems that people do, proprietary based systems do that will um, streamline that and you, your plants will mechanically move down a, a line as they get older more mature and that changes the amount of light that they get but uh, most of the time 
people will just typically dim. Uh, all of uh, BIOS's fixtures come with standard mounting capabilities. So the leads are coming out of the driver box there along with your AC. And uh, you can just tie that into your favorite dimming system, Ritter, Agriculture, whatever, and, uh, or Agribus. And um, you, you dim to your, to your needs. I, when I do a layout, I will typically attempt to design around, to the best of my ability, the, my understanding of your growth. So if I'm, if I'm learning that you are growing in your building and you are doing uh, all flower phase and uh, flower phase for cannabis in room one, and then you're doing <laughs> leaf grains in room two for some reason, um, I will design to the best of my ability from beginning to end or whatever you specify. But uh, yeah, photo period is typically the way that we go around. I uh, don't really push photo period past 18 hours. I try not to, but I'm at I'm at your your command. <laughs> yeah, I think with you know, there's a lot of custom things that come into play. But um, again, we're willing to you know everyone's sort of a custom project when they come into us. Um, so we can delve into that a little bit more offline as well. I think I would like to cover this question. I, we have a, a few more minutes here. Um, Mark Sundin, I think it's really um, important, the cleanliness of a facility. Um, how easy or difficult is it to clean a facilities post-harvest? Are there any rack features that help with facilities cleanliness um, in, in, in and around the, uh, the racks? And William, I wanna just talk more about the lighting, the integration with Montel, um, with our lighting, we have a, a tempered glass covering on all of our LEDs. Um, nothing is exposed to all the elements. So it's really nice that you can take a rag and clean our lights. Um, I think that's a really important feature to think about when you're selecting your lights. Um, you know, understanding that these are probably your most, your most important decisions when you're starting your business or, or um, purchasing large items. So I think just thinking about how easy it is to clean a BIOS light putting that into a racking system like Montel. And, and William, if you want to talk about the coating and, and what you have on your racks um, to make them clean, I uh, would appreciate it. Yes, of course. Um, excellent question. So first of all, uh, how hard is it to clean a regular grow room with a regular rolling bench in it because you cannot move it? So for, first, First of all, with the uh, Montel's racking or any mobile uh, racking on railings, you can really move uh, your racking. Uh, you have more space to move them, so it's way easier to clean your floor, your ceilings, your walls. Uh, secondly, you can have more workers in there that can work together in multiple open alleys, so your work, your work, your sanitation crew is like way more efficient and way more happy, happier to to work in the, in there compared to the, these tight rooms or greenhouse with fixed rolling bench in it. Uh, another good point is you have the option with Motel to uh, buy the uh, Easy Clean uh, add-on, which is an antimicrobial uh, paint that you can put on your racking. So right there, it's another plus. And you, uh, with this kind of paint on the racking, you make sure you uh, minimize uh, microbial growth on it. Uh, what else can I can I add? Uh, for sure, all the details are considered when you work with us and we're with our partners. So, uh, the surfaces, the materials, uh, the easiness to to clean your setup. So it's it's all aspect that we put all our mind, minds together to make sure it's easier for your particular setup than uh, crops and uh, methodologies. Um, I think this is it. I hope uh, you're satisfied by the answer. <laughs> Yeah, and, and for sure. And I think it's it's just important, um, you know, in a facility to to actually, you know, keep it clean and, and to have the items in your facility that are going to allow you to make it easy for everyone to clean. So hopefully that was a, a good answer. Um, I think we're going to end here. Um, I think we've had a lot of great questions. Um, I We really appreciate it. Um, let's connect. We have all of our, if you want to take a photo of this uh, with your cameras, um, I think it's really important just to know that we're appreciative of um, your attendance today. If there are any more specific questions uh, you have about designing a facility, uh, lighting, racking, agritexture, um, how they can help with building out your facility using their software, um, reach out to us. Here's all of our handles that you're seeing in front of you um, from Montel 
um, your bios, plant, agritecture, our LinkedIn accounts, Twitter, um, you know, just Google us. And, and if you have any questions, we're here to answer anything that you have. Um, we hope you have a wonderful weekend. And again, thanks so much from all of us. And real quick, I just yeah. wanted to um, jump in. We do have three minutes and I don't know if there was any important questions left that you wanted to get to on, on the panel, if there was any. Okay. Um, if there's not, then we're good to go. But I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't any that um, got missed or that we could answer it real quick with the three minutes we have. Yeah. I was trying to give everyone a three minute. Of course. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> trying to give three minutes back. Um, <laughs> but um, just wanted to I check. If not, if the panel's good, then, then let's sign off. Um, here's one that Josh just put up. Um, at, he just chimed in. He got his last one in. Um, do you think vertical farms will have an increased desire for personal use in homes in the future? Um, I mean, I think panelist wise, I mean, Jeffrey, what are your, what are your thoughts? Oh, I'm sorry, Colleen, I missed that last part. That's okay. Um, do you think vertical farms will have an increased desire for personal use uh, in our homes for the future? Yeah, you know, especially with this pandemic, I think more and more people are trying to, to see what they can do themselves from a personal standpoint. Absolutely. Um, and there, there are many ways to go about it. You can build a, a DIY system. You can purchase a consumer product system. Um, and I'm sure there are going to be new systems coming online. Um, we actually developed a, a DIY open source system called Plus Farm um, that gives you the tools, instructions on how to build your own, you know, vertical farming little rack uh, in your home, your apartment, wherever it may be. So if anyone's interested in that, you can go to plus.farm. It's P-L-U-S dot F A R M. So that's just one way to kind of see how you can bring it home indoors and do it yourself. Yeah, I think a lot of um, from the, t the ag tech side, we're seeing a lot of um, really great technology coming out where you'll be able to grow leafy greens and, and um, uh, type of enclosure system. So um, I, there's one last one. Um, electricity and labor are two top costs in vertical farms. LEDs are 70% of the electric uh, electricity bill. Are you able to address the challenges and propose solution options in this regard? Um, I think one of them is, is you know, the energy rebate side and, and getting the energy rebates and, and allowing us to help you with that. We do have an in-house team that um, will take care of your energy rebates. So getting some back um, from that initial investment that you make. Um, we also can show, um, you know, over the course of the years, your payback. Normally you're paying off an LED system within a year and a half because you're saving all those costs. Um, with all the different things that um, you have in the facility. Um, does anybody else want to add in to, to my thoughts? Um, you so, know, our, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I usually, I always am in a struggle with coming up with the easy way to install fixtures because it's not always, it's never really just about the person who sells the cheapest fixtures. It's how also, how inexpensively can you get those put, put into your application? Right. So obviously, maximizing the simplicity of that is a, a big part of my job and so yes um for instance that first bracket that i showed during my little section of, this, of the uh, presentation was the quick mount bracket in a mobile in a mobile unit um or for mobile racking and that will uh all that's very simple for uh, an installer who knows much about lighting i mean if you have maintenance guys instead of an installation crew they can also do that they basically just interface those fixtures directly to that bracket you mount the bracket into the mobile panel and then uh, into the top of the pier and then you um you just basically stick them in the clips it i did one myself and without and typically there's two people that would install one fixture if you think about it uh you know the, the center upper and then the footer upper i guess and right. um i can do both both of those and get the fixture fully installed in two and a half minutes now i i have been doing that you know well practiced between multiple fixtures, but still, as any other installer would be, I would think, so that's equal footing. So, yes, the answer is yes, we do that, and we will, if I know more about your application, if you give me as many details as possible, we will work adamantly with you to get that all your time. Awesome. I think, um, you know, again, we had a lot of great questions. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the questions that came through. Um, that means that, that people want to learn, that, that we want to get somewhere, we want to keep 
um, you know, vertical farming on our mind and, and do whatever we can to help each other. So again, we're here, Agritexture, Montel, um, you know, BIOS, we're here to help, we're here to support. So please, if there's anything that we can help with, don't hesitate to reach out. We'll find you the, the master of what you need. Um, and again, we, thanks, we thank you so much. Uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks again. Take care.